and CEO of Martel Innovate, and I have the pleasure to be one of the partners of the Next Generation Internet of Things uh, project that is helping and assisting the European Commission and other um, researchers and innovators active in the Internet of Things field with a series of communication uh, support and coordination activities. These workshops aims to bring together um, um, various stakeholders within uh, the scene and uh, to animate discussions on what's going to be the vision for the future of IoT, in particular edge of IoT. In doing so, um, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce the first speaker that is also the newly appointed head of unit, Max Lemke, that will set the tone and uh, give us an overview of what are the uh, IoT and edge computing future directions for Europe. Uh, so Max, I give you the floor and I also give you a chance to share your screen so we can all uh, see your presentation while you speak. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Monique, for the introduction. Uh, do you see my screen, by the way, now? Good. Okay. I'm also trying to share my face, but I don't know whether that works. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Okay. So, good. So, yeah, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining for this, for this online workshop. Still a strange feeling always doing online workshops, but... Uh, that's the way how we work at the moment. So I'm the new head of unit for the unit on Internet of Things in the in DigiConnect in the Commission. Some of you or many of you may know me from my previous life until end of last year as head of unit for digitizing industry, Industry 4.0, including manufacturing, Excel joint undertaking, and the digital innovation hubs and things like that. I've then spent six months of a sabbatical fellowship in the United States in Seattle in the world capital of cloud technologies and I did some study on innovation there and now I'm back as head of unit for the Internet of Things. So I would like to give you a short introduction on what we look at today to set the scene and I would like to start with just saying we what we do here is all within the we operate within our po political priorities. I don't put them all up. I just put the one on shaping Europe's digital future up here because what we do in our research and innovation program and in digital Europe, so Horizon Europe and Digital Europe is always in the context of this these political priorities and in particular on this one shaping Europe's digital future so the deployment of technology that works for people fair and competitive digital economy and also an open democratic and sustainable society and now there were two publications communications from the commission one on data and one on ai and if you want to see where all of this is rooted you could just go into these com uh, communications and see more see more detail i would like to refer to in particular in the middle here the european federation of cloud infrastructure and services and establishing common european data spaces that is at the core of what we discuss here but then also because everything gets smarter, more intelligent, AI is the technology we use in order to help our applications and which requires the more intelligent and smarter device. So this is just the political priorities. Now, when I look from a technology perspective, the next generation of Internet of Things, where are we going? What do we see? So I have tried to summarize that here briefly from a strategic point of view. We see that digital enabling technologies in a way converge. You cannot distinguish like we did in the past in organizations, in the commission, in silos. One silo on data, one on processing, computing, one on connectivity, one of intelligence. I think it's all coming together. So we should also not take silo approaches here. We should, we should holistically look at that. And the buzzword Internet of Things, in a way, is, well, if you interpret it broadly, is bringing all these things in a way together. Now, there are system level approaches, and that's why I say the Internet of Things brings it together. There are other words for it, which are cognitive cyber physical systems. I think that's very, very close to each other, and also depending on how you interpret that. 
What we see and what our commissioner has said in many of his speeches, we see a trend, or I would say it could develop towards a paradigm shift to the edge. Let's say from the cloud to the edge. Today we have 80% of processing of data on the cloud and 20% at the edge. And this may well change in the next five years when we get things like the autonomous car and other, other new applications coming in and then we will see that more will go into the edge and the reason for it going to the edge is to protect privacy to keep security if you process it at the edge you don't have to send it around the world time and safety critical i mean we always are against the speed of light we cannot change the speed of light so if you have to take a quick decision a very quick decision a real-time decision you cannot do it via the network so you cannot do it on the cloud. So these decisions have to be taken locally, like in your autonomously driving car. So for time and safety critical applications, it's essential to do things at the edge. And the same for environment and energy reasons. If you don't send it around, it may be cheaper to process it directly in a low power computing ship on at the edge. So also computing power is moving to the edge. And you could say, in a way, it's moving to the data, whereas in the past, we often moved the data to the computers, and that's what we still do on the, on the cloud. We now go a bit in the direction that computing power is moved to the edge where the data is. And that means intelligence goes to the edge. So we'll, we'll get smarter and smarter devices. So that's a bit the trend that I see. And I want to see today whether this is confirmed. The closer we get to the edge, the more application-specific customization we need but let me let, let me before i go into that just ex tell you a little bit what i see as edge and and what i see i mean there are blurred lines i put here iot edge device i put the edge cloud and the cloud hpc infrastructure the lines between them are blurred i mean that's very clear it's so you cannot draw the line also you may have four boxes in there you may have an edge cloud and you may have an edge cloud even closer to the to the leaves of the edge but in general, we see, we see the public cloud on the right-hand side. That's where you go through public, where you go through networks. Security, privacy may be an issue there. We have the edge cloud that I would see as kind of a computing system that sits in a factory, that sits on an airport, that sits in a car, in a tractor, or in a hospital, or in an operating theater of a hospital. So that's already more protected. But there are also things still the data for many devices come together and decisions are centrally taken. Now, if I go one step further outside to the leaves of a tree, you get to the edge. Cameras, uh, you, you, you have sensors, you have all kinds of devices that collect data and that gets smarter and smarter. So I'm talking here about the edge, the, I, the, edge, the IoT device, which was with a blurred line between them. But we would see that more and more computation in future is likely to be done here on the edge because devices get smarter. You have computing power in the edge. And you may also see several edge devices working together in computing on a certain thing. So certain decisions that you would now do here and which are moving already here, you may see being done here. Now, if I come back now to my slide, on the closer we get to the edge, the more application-specific customization needs to be. And I can just give you an example. I want to give you an example from the autonomous driving. Now, when you look at how you customize, you have general purpose processors, Intel x86, typical example. So that you, those you find generally everywhere. You have low energy mobile, you have the ARM low power processor. You find them also a lot in your mobile phone, for example, and in many places. You have the real time processors like the Infineon Tricore that you, that you find in autonomous cars and energy applications, which are particularly made for real time. So they are already quite, quite special for a certain group of applications. You see that today's cloud resources, cloud infrastructures give you access to graphics and matrix processing like the NVIDIA and the GPU. You also see that, that the cloud offers you particular and as Google calls it, tensor processors. 
I would say that's the next generation of the NVIDIA or the GPUs because it's just for multi-dimensional matrices. And that is the typical thing you need for the inference phase in artificial intelligence. And then you see particular processes for the training, the neuromorphic processors that are in the pipe coming, not yet used, uh, for, for, for training. But when you particularly look at an application, like let's say the autonomous car, what do you need? You cannot take all the general purpose things. You have to have something very specialized because you need extremely high performance, because you need to take decisions, uh, decisions in real time. You need low energy because you also want to have those in an electrical car. You don't want that the uh, reach of the car goes down from 100 kilometers to 50 kilometers just because you have a powerful processor in there. You want low cost because it's a mass product and you don't want that your car price is very high. So real time safety and it has to be good for AI inference because you, you don't need to learn in the car directly as we see it at the moment, but you definitely need to evaluate the matrices that come from the AI algorithm. So you need something very special, a very special purpose processor at the edge for autonomous driving. So that brings me to the point, the closer, the, the, the point here, the closer you get to the edge, the more application specific customization is needed. So we have cloud computing services, which are still largely general purpose and application agnostic, not totally, but to a large extent. And you see edge computing must be strongly customized towards the application. So the concepts we see for the future is this compute continuum that goes from the edge device to the cloud. That's how we would like to see it. You see IoT edge meta level operating system discussions coming up. And you also see that this gets very complex. So we need platforms on which we can work together and, and how to be able to at all use this because we cannot all do it in every single application alone, but we need the platform where the different actors come together to work together. Now, if I look at Europe now, now this was the technology perspective where, where we think we are going. We want to hear from you, are we having the right picture? Now on Europe's potential, generous purpose cloud computing, so infrastructure, as a service is in the hands of US and Chinese digital giants. I mean, we, I think we can all acknowledge that. And we may through federation, and I believe in that, get more European resources up, but we will, it's not our aim. We have to work with those. It's not our aim to, to substitute them with European resources. Also that, that, that will never work. So we, but we see this trend from cloud to edge as a paradigm shift. And we know that Europe is strong. And when I said edge is more application oriented, it has to be customized for the application. We know that Europe is strong in industrial applications. Europe is also strong on sensors. Look, for example, at Bosch and some other companies. Europe is strong in cyber physical systems. So it's an opportunity to regain competences and market shares for EU actors. So I, I think that, and that's the driver for us. We see this as an opportunity for Europe to reinforce its place between the US and China. And, and you hear, see more and more webinars and, and discussions on the powers, US, China, and how is Europe in the middle? And who, how is Europe in between? Are we squeezed or are we developing our own identity or maintaining our own identity? And I think that's critical for Europe. And in order to be able to have our identity maintained, we need to a certain extent technological autonomy, at least in sectors where we are leading. So in automotive, if we want to, we still have all the, the incumbents, are, most the strong incumbents are European. So if we want to continue leading, we need to master the value chain in automotive. And that also means we need to master the digital part of that. So in order to get there, we need a broad approach and we see already a lot ongoing across many sectors. So when I talk about industrial Internet of Things, that's or smart Internet of Things, that's not just a small thing. It's not just the connectivity, but we call we, we talk about bringing the microelectronics, the photonics, the software and systems, the analytics and data fusion algorithms, the 5G network, everything together, the operating system 
and to we need to pilot it and we need partnerships for those so this is basically the space we are operating in and competition is not sleeping so we need speed speed and again speed so just to say I don't want to tell anything now because it's premature on where this will be addressed, addressed in future programs. But I would clearly advocate that you don't think that this workshop now aims at one particular topic. It's a broader discussion and you will find bits and pieces in future in this program, probably across the space that I am uh, pointing out here. We are at the moment in discussion of all these programs of all these areas, but it's not, we are not ready to talk about that now in, in public. But definitely what I can say, there will be likely a lot in Horizon Europe under cluster four, either in the joint undertakings, key digital technologies or smart networks and services, or in the work programs that, come, that are complementary to those. For example, in destination three world leading data and computing technologies. That just gives you a hook. And in the Digital Europe program, which is more rollout of, techno of digital technologies related, you also will find something under the artificial intelligence pillar on data spaces, cloud to edge federation, and also testing and experimentation, but on the AI header. And last not least, in the application clusters in Horizon Europe, in the second pillar, you will find the security cluster, you'll find the energy and mobility cluster, and the one that has agriculture and other things in there. And there we are looking at the application perspective, but at the edge, we are very close to the application, so we cannot disconnect from that. Now, in this workshop, and that's my slide before uh, I, I give back, and, and, and or do, do you talk directly after me, Rolf? Directly, yeah. So I hand over to Rolf for three slides. But I would like to just say we look at this next generation of Internet of Things from all kinds of perspectives in this meeting. We start looking at enabling technologies and no, we start looking at the application. Now I made a mistake in the order. We, we start looking at the application needs first. So, sorry, I gave the wrong numbers here. The application needs is first, then we look at the cross-cutting issues, then we look at the technology and hardware, and then we look at the enabling technologies. So, one and four have to be switched around. Yeah, so, so, we look at all perspectives, and I would like to invite you to be open. Don't think in terms of only what comes out of this unit, for example, on the large scale piloting, that's an aspect. We may look at that in future as well. But the discussion here should be much broader than that. And with that, I would like to thank you for participation. Participating today, I'll be around largely all day and listen to what you say and take my notes, not only from the summary, but also from what, what, what you say. And then we see how we, how we go further. So thank you very much, and I hand over to to Rolf now. Thank you, Mark. So, good. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think um, warm welcome also from my side. I think with most of the speakers, I've been in touch and preparation of the workshop. Particular thanks to um, the CSA NGIOT for supporting the workshop, but also for the Alliance IOTI, uh, who's also co organizer of, of the workshop. I think um, not much to add from my side. Um, I don't want to go through the slides at the moment, but just to remind you um, um, just to go slip on the slide. Um, how do I go next to the slide? Oh, yes. Just to remind you on, on IoT, um, IoT is basically connecting different things. Um, IoT is key in collecting data. Um, um, IoT also has been proven in order to monitor different um, systems, environments in, in different areas. Um, IoT, in the essence, is sort of an enabling technology to work across different silos. Uh, I will not go to the different details at the moment, but just to remind you now, it's a technology workshop today, and we want to see, you know, what is happening um, beyond that, what I mentioned, and um, what's happening particularly on the part of monetization. 
Um, I think more than 70% of IoT revenues today are cloud native, um, meaning is that continuing in the future or what are sort of enabling technologies and where do we see a paradigm shift from the application, from the system? I think Max mentioned quite a lot of that or from enabling technologies like microelectronics or key digital technologies. So that is the essence of the workshop. I don't want to go further. Don't want to prevent or consume more time. Uh, and I pass back the floor to Monique. Thanks, wish you a stimulating workshop today. And I said, no, it's the first of its kind. It's technology driven, it's open. You want to see what is the bot, what's coming up bottom up in order to shape and tune our future agenda under Horizon Europe, cluster four specifically, but also in relation to other initiatives like KDT, the smart networks and services, um, and the I policies. So we have to find our position. We are exploring that things, and it's the first workshop to test the water. And I'm looking really much forward to have your input and to have stimulating discussion today. Thank you. Back to Monique. Thank you, Rolf. Thank you, Max. Um, I would kindly ask you to stop sharing your screen, so I will stop. My, I will uh, start sharing mine. Um, just to quickly introduce uh, the next speakers, um, so you might see now my screen. So, um, can you see my screen? Not yet, Monique. Not yet. Well, it might come. But we see you. Well, okay. <laughs> then I, you know, I was so cute. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so, um, next speaker will be um, Martin Brinskov. Um, that is uh, the coordinator, is professor at University, Aarhus University, is um, uh, chair of the OASC. Uh, in he, he can wear several hats, but today he will be giving an introduction about next generation IoT as he's coordinating our um, uh, project, the coordination and support action that is being organizing uh, this event. I'm glad to see that these slides are now on screen. So I leave the floor to Martin. Thank you very much, Monique. And uh, thanks, Max and Rolf, for the uh, introduction and welcome. And uh, also to the colleagues uh, for taking the time uh, to speak here. And, and especially, of course, the Commission and, and uh, the Alliance for, for setting this up together with us. Yes. So um, Max, thanks for the very clear introduction. I think this is a very, very helpful starting point that we actually have a clear overview from what you see, not just from being uh, many years in the commission, but also on the West Coast and, and this global picture. Uh, you said it all. <laughs> I will add a few uh, uh, aspects and then I'll, I'll, I'll pass the, the floor on to, to Palm. Um, so, so just to say, yes, I'm uh, the coordinator of NGIOT. And uh, at the moment, everybody is asking, so what is IoT as such? Well, as you also pointed out, it, act it actually, is when we have limitations, we have limited capabilities, whether it's uh, for physical reasons, for political reasons, for organizational regions. I mean, everybody needs to be able to uh, use and operate and be comfortable. So one thing to have in mind is, uh, do we then apply these limitations to all the different uh, aspects like connectivity, you said, uh, uh, sovereignty, um, uh, or do we uh, see actually a field in the middle to, to tackle this. Very, very uh, difficult question to answer, and I'm sure we will advance on this today. <laughs> IoT is core strategy for Europe. There is no doubt about it. First of all, you made it very clear also uh, in the opening, but um, maybe just to dig uh, a little deeper. So um, certainly there's, there's uh, you could say, a position uh, between the US and Chinese um, modes uh, of operating in this space. And one you could call, it has to be compliant, compliant with humans, <laughs> uh, not least. I mean, the human centricity is essential. We have seen uh, the world falling apart because of lack of cohesion and lack of, of trust, in fact. So it's not just about safety and efficiency. Um, we have seen other parts of the world focusing on that. It is about inclusion and democratic resonance, otherwise we're doomed. 
it is about prosperity, but not just economic. So it's also about the kind of business you can do, the kind of life you can, you know, start up and thrive. We have seen very, very um, impressive uh, movements uh, on the uh, industrial uh, side in the US, in China. But we would like to see prosperity in the wake of that, just uh, not, you know, misery for half the world's population. So I think that's a very, very sound backdrop. There is very good business in that. I don't think we need to mention names, but certainly in the uh, green digital space already, uh, as we saw, for instance, at last uh, IoT, we very uh, prominently featured. Then we need to think about the integration of the digital green, which is, of course, also in the strategic uh, focus of the Commission. So it's not just about dividing and conquering these uh, elements and, and then hope someone will put it together. No, we will have to understand it in uh, you know, a strategic uh, resilient context. My last point is that IoT is not just about limited capabilities. It's also when the digital takes place. And I mean that in a very physical sense, when it hits the ground. We know just from economics, and many of you will know this slide, but, but this is the, the GDP, as it were, of subnational governments. So the local level, how much is spent. Um, and that's more or less a quarter of, of the economic activity in large parts of Europe and incidentally also in uh, China and Canada. So yes, we need to focus on technology and on industry, but our economy, we need to understand the public private interaction here, if not alone for the economic implications and uh, how we can uh, utilize that. Um, you mentioned other units, and I think I'd also want to point out here the very successful collaboration between the IoT unit and, and other units, including the um, uh, Smart Mobility and Living H5 um, in, in DG Connect, and um, to point to actually some very promising initiatives which can layer around uh, the technology discussion here, uh, including Connect, uh, Grow, Regio, Digit, um, with lots of of stakeholders around from both uh, demand and supply side. So just to say that, that actually, I think we have a very good overview of how these things are coming together. And then we need to carve out the space for what is IoT or whatever we will choose to call it. So that's why we're here today. My final slide, we have a high baseline, especially as you also pointed out, Max, when it comes to the integration of complexity, the long-term resilience in a way we want to uh, be and um, having a inclusive approach also when we develop and deploy technologies. So those are my words and back to you, Monique. Thank you for taking us through the day. And uh, yeah, Monique will present much more detail from uh, what we have done so far within NGIOT. Uh, and we hope to uh, advance a lot further today and in the coming months together with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. As always, you're fresh and waking us up, which is what we need. Um, I know that online events can be sometimes a little bit, uh, yeah, we tend to escape in our emails, our tables, everything around us. But now we have another very exciting um, intervention from Farm uh, Rewell, and she's a chair of um, Alliance for IoT Innovation. So she's part of the steering board and she's uh, from Vodafone. Um, so, Parm, uh, it's my pleasure to let you the floor and uh, give you the mic. Thank you, Monique. Um, and it's a pleasure to be part of this conversation today on behalf of the Alliance for Internet of Things um, Innovation, or better known as AIOTI. So just a little bit of background, AIOTI is the multi-stakeholder platform for stimulating IoT innovation in Europe. It brings together small and large companies, startups, scale-ups, um, academia, policymakers, um, and end users in an end-to-end -end approach. We really strive to leverage, share, and promote best practices in the IoT ecosystem while proactively addressing key issues and roadblocks for economic growth, acceptance, um, and adoption of IoT innovation in society. So we really believe IoT's underlying communication networks and security technologies are not goals in themselves, Rather, they enable applications that contribute to the welfare, well-being of European citizens and empower the digital transformation of our industries, companies, and public services. So we believe a more holistic 
end-to-end -end approach is critical for the socioeconomic success of digitization across the value chain, um, building on expertise in, for, for example, um, sensing hardware, system integration, communications, data storage and processing, um, AI, and, and also its applications. So in relation to edge computing, AIOTI sees these approaches requiring responsive network connectivity to allow de devices and humans to control and manipulate objects in real or virtual environments. We see that AI enables IoT in an edge computing environment to uncover meaningful insights and inform decision making. So in the future, IoT applications, uh, within IoT applications, AI will be increasingly embedded within several IoT um, architectural layers to strengthen security, safeguard assets, and reduce fraud. So uh, in conclusion, I just want to say AIoTI sees the research challenges in this area covering um, you know, looking at open distributed edge computing architectures and implementation for IoT, wireless communication and networking and edge computing for IoT, uh, and lastly, built in end-to-end -end distributed security, trustworthiness, and privacy issues um, in edge computing for IoT. So with that, I just want to say I'm really looking forward to uh, this session uh, today to learn more about more from the great lineup of speakers um, about the opportunities in this space, but also explore some of the solutions to the challenges um, ahead, ahead of us. So uh, thank, you for, thank you for the time and I'll pass it back to Monique. Thank you very much, um, Pam. I think um, I, I will try now to show my screen as it's my time to speak. Um, I hope it's going to work. Otherwise, uh, I will drop my slides uh, to Verena so that she can show them. Um, just give me a second. Uh, here we go. So you should now possibly um, try to share my screen. Voila. Does it work? Yes, it's about to come up. Now you just have to go to full screen. Perfect. So um, first of all, allow me to move you back, move us back. So um, together on the edge, uh, it was difficult to come after these um, prominent speakers and tell you something um, new, something interesting. I guess that we all feel that uh, edge is the next big topic or it's Mm, one of the main uh, areas where indeed, as Max anticipated, many of the research and innovation activities across several domains from AI to IoT to big data to cloud uh, to, to connectivity are um, merging. Now, how to do it right? Um, it's, it's one of the big questions, right? Um, so uh, today, uh, what I wanted to share with you is the fact that we have been looking into it within the, the context of the next generation Internet of Things uh, um, coordination and support action. We have published recently um, quite dense deliverable, which concerns, you know, um, positioning um, IoT uh, research, innovation and deployment efforts within the broader uh, scope, also in view of the transition towards Horizon uh, Europe. And uh, today I would like to share with you a few things about, in particular, IoT and Edge. Well, as you know better than me, um, there's many examples of Edge computing that are already uh, part of our everyday life, and this is just increasing. So we have uh, many examples from Internet of Things. We have many examples at the level of industrial Internet of Things. What's happening, as also anticipated by other speakers, is that um, the cost of communicating, transporting back data uh, from where they are produced or gathered to where they should be processed is too high, is becoming too high. And also the fact that many of the applications that we want to use uh, do not allow the time uh, that is interfering between the um, you know, data, data gathering, processing, and um, data uh, usage. So what's happening is that across many scenarios uh, that concern our everyday lives, life, there is an increasing need to have a smarter sensor, smarter devices uh, that are capable uh, to gather, collect, and process data close to where they need to be used. Um, 
this um, today will be explored from different directions, as already anticipated by Max. We will have several sessions that try to bring together, on the one hand, the let's say um, market pool trends, so the needs, the requirements from uh, uh, several uh, segments and applications. On the other hand, what we will try to uh, consider and examine are the technological push factors, uh, the progress, the evolution, uh, what the technologies and solutions that are being made available already um, allow to do, um, allow doing. Also, we know there's several regula regulatory uh, standardization, legal um, aspects that will uh, need to be tackled much more in depth. So all of these aspects come together and we hope that in the discussions today you will have a flavor of what it means. As, anticipa as anticipated, this kind of webinar, this kind of workshop, because it's rather extended, will, um, is just the first appointment with the community. And we hope that you will be able to contribute. So please, while I speak, drop your questions um, and, and comments also in the chat that is available to you. Now, as I mentioned, NGIOT has done quite some work on identifying future direction for IoT, and in particular, we have uh, been working um, by um, considering several aspects, given that, as you know better than me, um, it's, it's very difficult to, to speak in terms of Internet of Things technology. Uh, um, it's, it's, it should be seen as an embracing um, discipline that um, goes across, cut across several uh, domains, and we mentioned the technological one several times by now, um, but it's also um, a, um, a fact that more and more the increasing deployment uh, of IoT, uh, whether it's embedded in our bodies or embedded in the devices we use, has having a, a major impact on the way we live, the way we interact, the way we think, the way we, we learn even. And this is why um, a multidisciplinary approach is definitely key to understand who also how technologies will evolve. So there's uh, a lot of studies and work also done from uh, more uh, of, a, of a sociological, psychological, economic, um, ethical point of view. Now, um, I won't go into the details because I, I don't have much time and I want to leave enough time for our speakers. Um, I will give you the pointer and in, the, in our dedicated uh, page on the NGIOT portal, uh, the dedicated page to this event, there is a link to our uh, deliverables. So you will see that what we have identified is a, um, uh, a number of uh, what we call major priority. And we classify them uh, in two broad uh, groups, economic and societal, and research, innovation, and deployment. And in particular here, you see highlighted with some square number four, number seven, number eight at the economic and societal level, number two, number six, seven, and eight at the research, innovation, and employment level that are the ones in particular that relate IoT and edge, because this is where very much edge computing and IoT um, goes together more and more. Now, um, we also try to identify a timeline. Uh, we proposed, a, you know, a sort of a roadmap, um, anticipating what we believe, uh, also according to recent market studies that we have um, elaborated and built on top of, but also interviewing, uh, consulting experts in the work we've done. We have identified also, also a timeline um, and the expected maturity of, of uh, different um, let's say, uh, technologies um, that would fit to specific priorities. So you will see here um, on the, um, in the slide, on the um, priority column that is the first, you will see that we have recommendation two, recommendation six, recommendation seven and eight, and we identify some um, specific uh, sub-recommendations that concern very much the discussions of today. Um, as I said, I uh, would uh, um, recommend uh, to read our paper, to download it, comment it, because this is a living document. It should serve the community and it should serve us to understand better what uh, directions our efforts, our community should take. So please feel free to do so um, at any point in time, even offline. 
Now, um, you can still see my screen, right? So I will share with you uh, another slide that is uh, session one, because it's my pleasure to now uh, introduce you um, um, four speakers for a session that will focus on um, highlighting um, how we can depict the future uh, five years from now, considering key scenarios and emerging uh, needs in Edge IoT. Um, so the first speaker is uh, um, um, uh, Thomas Gell from um, Siemens, and he will talk to us about connected gold infrastructure. I guess I have to leave the screen, right, Verena? Yes, please. If uh, Tom has a presentation, Tom, you could share your screen now and take the floor. I see Tom online. You're muted, Tom. Yes, uh, I'm just uh, setting the presentation. Okay. Does that work? Yes, we see now your PowerPoint. When you go to slideshow, then we can see the slides completely. Yes. We are. Uh, so thanks for inviting me. Uh, I am with Siemens Mobility. And uh, within Siemens Mobility, uh, there is a department called Shared Autonomous Mobility. And that's exactly what I will talk about today on the requirements we have to IoT and we have to edge computing. Uh, I was a member or Siemens was a member in the big IoT, the uh, European community funded project. Uh, that's the origin. That's where we took uh, the concepts and even parts of the software, uh, what we run today. Uh, what's special, uh, uh, the only point from that slide is using shared shuttles. Uh, where is the difference? Uh, you see a lot of companies doing self-driving cars, uh, self-driving vehicles. Uh, the major difference to a shuttle or to a bus is that we cannot do any uh, emergency stops. Uh, clearly we can do, but it's not so easy. Uh, usually people do not wear uh, belts or have protection system. So uh, an emergency break will definitely result in injured passengers. And this requires either you drive very slowly, or that's probably not what we are looking for, uh, or you have additional safety features in place and that's where we exactly think uh, there will be a market and uh, Siemens is focusing on that marking market. Uh, we say infrastructure will need to help shuttles and on the other side I'm not sh even sure that uh, cars won't appreciate that extra help. Uh, especially uh, we have situations that are currently a challenge for the self-driving cars. Oh, that's clearly all the weather and that's clearly a complex traffic situation uh, wherever that is. It's clearly not in Europe, uh, but uh, it looks really funny how they really solve that problem. But humans uh, tend to do that rather good. Uh, so there are a lot of scenarios I will cut short uh, as I have only a very limited time today. Uh, a lot of scenarios where we can help. You have 10 minutes, Tom. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Minutes. Yeah. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, situations uh, where infrastructure uh, can look around the corner, can detect uh, pedestrians, uh, can be, uh, detect bicycles, and especially uh, in the areas uh, where usual cars cannot see, as they have a limited sight over the edge, so they have a limited sight uh, over hills or uh, against sun, or you see that here, rain, fog. That's all the things that uh, harm the, uh, at least the rate of recognition, and that's where infrastructure can help. 
uh, bringing me to the exact point uh, where we uh, are going to discuss concepts today. Clearly, uh, there is a lot of our system running in the in the cloud in the backend. That's all the strategic things, the the root management, the uh, changes, the regulations we uh, give the cars. Uh, but all information that needs to be fast and reach the car in time, uh, as I think Max was it already mentioned, uh, that you only have a couple of mini milliseconds uh, and that's not feasible to, uh, even if we think about 5G, it's nevertheless not feasible to have these calculations done uh, in the cloud. So we uh, have Edge computing here in place, that's the traffic cell uh, computer, the TC3. Uh, it comes together with a roadside unit and the roadside unit does the communication with the car. Uh, that's how the current system is working. Uh, it works with Wi-Fi as well as 5G. You all know there is a discussion and different, uh, different vendors uh, are using either Wi-Fi or, or, or going the 5G direction. Uh, that's clearly, we will support both in that way. And that's really my key message to say, we will have a lot of information that's not time critical, that's in the cloud. And we have all the security and time critical information next to the road uh, available for the cars and communicated with the cars. And it's a bi-directional connection, so the car will uh, take the same and uh, yeah, give feedback and give uh, findings of it all or problems it encounters uh, back to the system uh, via the roadside units as well. We already, uh, th that's a system that's already in place. Uh, that's Munich, Munich Perlach where we have a large campus within Siemens and we do all the autonomous driving uh, and have a lot of infrastructure. We definitely have more infrastructure set up to our poles that we really need uh, as it's part of our evaluation to say which infrastructure works best uh, and then how to decide reducing infrastructure first to critical crossings to critical areas, as well as reducing infrastructure to only a few sensors. So currently we have mostly all what's available, starting from cameras, ending up with radars and lidars. Uh, that's how the, the backend displays the, the information. So that's pedestrians, cars walking around. Just, just give you a, a short overview. Uh, that's the camera pictures and the tractorials where the cars or uh, people with bikes or pedestrians were recognized on our campus. Well, that's a more infrastructure driven where you can access, have access to all the sensors and all the information on the sensors. And my most prominent slide is what we already found out. So we had a lot of uh, it's uh, currently in test driving, so the, the autonomous car does just driving around. So we will, within this year, start with an uh, autonomous regular shuttle uh, operation. And that's what we found out so far. You see the hotspots, that's the hotspots where the security driver today has uh, intervened for what reason ever, uh, but you see uh, it, it's uh, at the red dots or red clouds here. Uh, the, uh, these two are our casinos. So during lunchtime, there is a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, that's the exit or entrance to the, to the campus. So there is, uh, yeah, crossing. Uh, and the real big one is where construction was going on. Uh, so they changed the lanes, they changed the accessibility of the lanes. 
So that was mainly uh, very interesting findings from, from our pilot we were running. That's the current test beds we are running. So OTS, that's uh, already finished one in Munich. Heat is the next you will be able to see. Heat will be demonstrating uh, demonstrated at the next ITS Congress uh, in 21. Uh, yeah, as soon as Corona will will allow that to to be held. But the shuttle is already in test operations, and there is a similar setup in Singapore. Uh, and there are plans uh, at uh, the airport in Munich. And probably you have heard uh, of the uh, tests Corona 9, uh, where we supervise uh, the uh, park, not the parking lane, the safety lane uh, at the autobahn. Uh, that is meant to supervise whenever a, a self-driving car runs into problem, it will slow down and will park in the safety lane on the right side. And that's something we then supervise and uh, yeah, create an emergency message and uh, initiate the next steps. Thank you, I'm perfect in time. Almost, there is uh, 30 seconds left. Thank you for Thank following you. and let me know if there are any questions. Thank you, Thomas. I suggest that we take the questions at the end of the session. Um, uh, so uh, now I give the floor to the next speaker. And uh, of course, I have too many open uh, windows and papers. <laughs> The next one uh, is uh, Oliver van der Mond, I hope I pronounced correct the names, that will give us an overview about smart energy. And um, Oliver is from Lemon Beat. Yeah, thanks for having me and uh, giving me the chance to present our view on the future needs of smart energy applications in IoT. Um, just let me share my screen. Um, Okay, I hope it works. Oh, good. Okay, perfect. So just a brief introduction. Um, LemonBeat is a provider of IoT technology with a focus on applications in the energy space. Um, we create white label solutions, uh, which are then marketed by energy companies, but we um, also do projects with industry partners to create completely new solutions based on our technology. Um, Okay, but today uh, about smart energy. So what are the particularities in, in smart energy applications? Um, when it comes to energy utilities, the main focus here is really um, in the energy grid. So that can be for electricity, for gas, for water, what have you. Right? So this means we are typically talking about a very large infrastructure with many largely distributed <laughs> devices monitoring various assets in the grid. Uh, this can be local substations or even energy meters in residential buildings for large grid operators. Um, if you think about that, these are easily many millions of devices. Yeah, so it's a huge infrastructure. Um, what we currently see, however, is the attempt um, to enable, and that is what you see um, here as uh, nowadays, um, uh, to enable traditional SCADA systems and connect them to the cloud. Uh, we have mm -hmm. heard about that, uh, I think, already um, today a little bit um, in, in terms of industrial um, IoT. So, but with this approach, most of the logic still sits within large controllers, which are now supported by some further intelligence in the cloud. Um, we are not really convinced that such large infrastructure can become smart with that approach. So for us, a real IoT-based approach will even need to increase the intelligence in the grid, but push it basically in two directions. One is, like in many use cases, towards the cloud. And I think that is also what we have heard today um, uh, several times, that a lot still happens uh, in, in terms of IoT in the cloud. I think the main reason for that is 
that a lot of especially industrial IoT applications are kind of a retrofit of existing SCADA systems. You just put um, a cloud connection on top and then you, you say it's IoT. For us, it's not really IoT, um, but um, okay. I mean, that's what you can do for, for the time being. It's, I think, fair enough, but um, I think for larger applications, for larger networks, that will become difficult to, to um, um, to roll this out, to deploy this, because um, it will simply be too cost uh, inefficient. Um, and also, in, to some extent, um, with this kind of technology, you cannot cover this amount of, of devices and, and data. Um, so the other is then not to the cloud, but uh, will even further down to what <clears throat> I would rather call the far edge. Yeah, and that is, um, I think that was also with uh, Max's presentation in the very beginning, um, that uh, we don't mean just gateways and, and local controllers with that, but really intelligent devices. And that in, in terms of smart energy can then be meters, sensors in the grid and so on. Yeah. So, um, for us, an important requirement for this to happen is to build a solid infrastructure between these two areas. Yeah, so the, the far edge and the cloud and where the intelligence will sit basically. So between the far edge and the cloud. Um, in our terms, we call this an IoT communication backbone. Um, and I think it's important to note that this goes far beyond just the question of connectivity. Yeah, so this is not just a question of 5G or something, but uh, it, it really means more than that. So what, what, how do we define, let's say, this, this IoT communication backbone? First, uh, for us, it's uh, the part of device integration. So that means the hardware interface to bringing a device into the IoT system. Uh, second and third, it's supporting use case dependent suitable connectivities and gateways. Yeah, so there we have the um, uh, point of connectivity. Fourth, it's um, being flexible uh, to connect different cloud infrastructures depending on where the data and information is needed. I think that's also important. Um, that will de heavily depend on the use case and um, there's not one IoT platform and I'm quite sure there won't be in the, in the uh, near future, but you will always have platforms with uh, that, that is meeting special requirements. Um, Fifth is having everything at hand to ensure that the established network of devices can be managed properly. For example, in terms of firmware updates, etc. cetera. Um, that is also what is um, in, in a lot of um, yeah, ways underrated, let's say with those retrofit solutions where you cannot really access then the edge, where it's just kind of a monitoring can just influence this network to some degree, but uh, not really to, to, to the far edge to the device level. And six, um, last point uh, that I think that's obvious that across the whole backbone and integrated security architecture ensures um, that the uh, system cannot be compromised. So um, to build this IoT backbone, um, for us, it wasn't as important to, to be flexible, actually, when it comes to hardware. Um, so especially for security reasons, and that is what we learn quite often um, when discussing with energy companies, is that there's also for hardware preference to rely on European players. Um, I think that was also um, mentioned already in the very beginning. Therefore, for us, hardware and silicon development as well shouldn't be given up too easily. Yeah? Uh, so uh, it's an important industry in Europe um, and um, the alternatives might not always be accepted. I think that's uh, very important to, to keep in mind. And I think uh, Max already mentioned that in the very beginning. Um, so to be independent in this regard, we are a strong supporter and, and contributor to the CEFA project of the uh, Linux Foundation, which uh, tries to establish a generic real-time operating system for IoT applications. Um, that is for us quite, quite important. And uh, we, we also see that um, this is at the moment in, in terms of um, a microcontroller um, real-time operating system. It's the uh, most successful and most um, active uh, community at the moment that we see worldwide. Um, independence also a good keyword when it comes to standards um, in the area of protocols. Um, I think there's a lot going on already, but for us, it's important not to wait for, let's say, this, this kind of silver bullet solution uh, that can cover each and everything. 
um, but to um, uh, look at, let's say, then the individual use cases. Um, assets in the energy space typically have a lifespan of 30 to 50 years, so um, sometimes even more than that. Um, so dealing with existing protocols in the field is necessary anyways. Yeah, you cannot just scrap uh, something that you have um, built 10 years ago that is simply a large investment and it's too um, expensive to, to, to um, yeah, just um, replace it because you need a new protocol. So more important for us than agreeing on a protocol that covers the whole technology stack um, is for us to at least agree on standards for um, the various levels of the system. And that can easily happen also across verticals, so not only within the uh, smart energy world. So therefore, that will be, uh, in, in my eyes, quite interesting, uh, inter interesting also then to exchange on that with uh, the, the other participants today from, from, let's say, other industries, other verticals, which are, which are um, uh, then served. Um, in the end, uh, also in smart energy, individual use cases are different yeah, and they will uh, to some extent and also define what protocol is, is suitable and sometimes also what is um, um, yeah, um, cost efficient in, in, a, in a way. So even if there are standards existing on all levels of a technology, there will be some work left, of course, yeah, to, to glue all this together. And um, our approach there is to try to be as open as possible. So for example, we published um, the whole specification uh, of our smart device language and how to implement it. So, so I think that's, uh, that open approach is, is quite important also for interoperability. Um, for connectivity, um, an important discussion currently is around the question whether the um, 450 megahertz frequency will be reserved for critical infrastructure applications. Um, we strongly support that this is going to happen. Uh, 450 megahertz has certain advantages in terms of range and penetration of material. Um, and that is especially important when assets are, yeah, if you want, buried underneath a lot of concrete and steel, yeah, what you have quite often um, uh, when it comes to metering devices, for example. Um, and uh, to, to um, reach those devices then still, even from, from a further distance, um, there are 450 megahertz that really has, has some uh, very good advantages. So in combination with low power hardware and, and protocols, um, 450 megahertz can also provide the necessary communication in case of brownouts. Uh, this can help to bring an electricity grid back online much quicker uh, in case you have a larger, larger outage, uh, for example. And we all know that due to um, um, yeah, um, uh, renewables, um, we see much more fluctuation in the grid than uh, just a couple of years uh, ago. And so, um, yeah, being there flexible, that, that will be very important. So um, those networks uh, with mainly constrained and low power devices behave differently uh, than standard telecommunication systems. And uh, I think also it's important then to, to provide for that. So last point um, yes, from my um, presentation, yeah. Yes, if you can speed up. I'll speed up, yeah. So last point is the uh, Gaia X um, uh, um, idea and uh, approach. We like that quite a lot. It's still in uh, its infancy. So we will see um, how that's going. Again, there, um, our approach is pretty much to, to yeah, stay flexible and um, be cloud agnostic so um, that uh, you can change also to such new infrastructures uh, quite easily because also there we see from, from customers, from energy companies that there's still some reluctance, uh, let's say then to, to bet on the uh, big suppliers. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. We will um, take questions at the end of the session. So now, uh, apologies, I, I switched, I swapped the order. And now it's um, uh, smart food farming with Harald Sandmaker uh, from Smart AgriHubs. Harald, the floor is yours. Yes, Monique, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure for me to make the presentation here. My name is Harald Sandmaker. I'm from ADB Institute for Applied Systems Technology. We are a not non-for-profit research organization. So um, the topic food and farming. Well, um, it's a quite heterogeneous sector with a lot of, let's say, as it was presented in the very beginning, a lot of silos, not just in the field, but also 
let's say, take a looking at the different sectors. And I'm presenting more or less uh, lessons learned experiences of uh, the IOF and Smart AgriHubs projects, where we did, let's say, over 80 initiatives, which I'm shortly characterizing here as our use cases in the IOF project, innovation experiments in the Smart AgriHubs projects, and also coming up new initiatives, what we did just due to COVID-19, where we made some pivots. So therefore, what I want now not to very much enter in all the very details, uh, when we are now talking about key scenarios in five years, I was also trying a little bit to reflect of what is really practical towards five years not just thinking about, oh, what might be nice for us as researchers to uh, learn and, and to experiment with, but also to have in mind, let's say, the market and the application potential. Therefore, when we're talking about digital transformation and especially having also in mind Edge IoT, it's uh, on the one hand, we have the technical issue because compared to a lot of other sectors when we are in the fields, well, we still have connectivity problems just due to availability. We just need to remind that. Therefore, Edge IoT on the field is, well, just a need to do. At the same time, when we are talking about financial perspective, well, uh, the cost of produce, so if I have corn, if I have tomatoes, well, in principle, it's rather low. Therefore, there's a limited willingness to invest and long payback periods. And uh, the question is also about the investment uh, of the stakeholders and often those who would need to invest are not those which are really gaining the profit. Then at the same time, we have a global marketplace. Um, often international directive or regulations set on from retailers or whomever and rather local implementations with also about national uh, heterogeneous implementations on directives, IT systems and so on. Um, and at the same time, we need to keep in mind it's an oligopoly of retailers and food producers and also some OEMs. And I just took here, so there are changes also for the farmers, 10 million farmers just in the EU, which is 96% of family business. I took the numbers from 2016. So therefore we have dynamic food supply networks, not like in other sectors where you just have one supplier and uh, or 10, 20 suppliers, which are very stable, but it's also due to the weather conditions. And at the very end, the relation of farmers to the consumers is quite anonymous. Therefore, I think it's a lot about uh, a discussion of the different stakeholders, because I think I like this picture in, in our team and the projects. We are using this quite for some time because it's about sensing analysis and control. And in different areas. I don't want to go, you will see some slides on this. So it's about decision-making for businesses, for consumers. It's about, we are talking about food integrity. Um, at the same time about public decision-making. It's also about food safety. It's about the environment. It's about the climate. So more and more, we're talking also about animal welfare. And then we see quite some potentials coming up by new technologies. Therefore, um, when now thinking about scenarios for edge IoT and farming, I was trying saying, okay, I see quite a lot of use cases, experiments where we are in the moment when thinking of five years ahead. So on the one hand, when we are talking about automation, we have quite high tech with the tractors on the field already. There's a lot of things going on about decades. However, when we are talking about autonomous driving, so the robot, the, the tractor as a robot on the field is reality. That's nothing new. Uh, however, it's also about interacting objects by different OEMs facilitating all this precision farming. So there are still quite some challenges. How this, how can we now make the next step? If we are talking about tracking and tracing, like when we are talking about the Green Deal from farm to fork. So how are we monitoring animals, pasture, location, origin, health with collar uh, and text, even room and bolo, so that you have some uh, devices, IoT devices in the stomach of the animal to analyze things. Then what's about animal welfare? So growth control by optimal feed intake, because we also need to ask ourselves, how can we control uh, the growth in cases of, let's say, this disturbances in the food chain. 
like if you have coronavirus uh, stoppage of slaughtering pigs, what we anyway had in Germany. Then what's about predictive analysis in the stables? How can you use video, noise, gas concentration, like analyzing health issues in the stables? Also facilitating, uh, let's say, automating quite some steps that the farmer need not to uh, invest so much in, in, in labor anymore. Then at the same time, supply and demand. Where is the supply? Where is the uh, farmer growing the food. So uh, when we're talking about right time control of environmental conditions, like different colors of the leaves, you can influence by light and uh, towards vertical farms with harvesting robot, possibly around the corner in the city. So are these the concepts? Well, all that is in principle, they are at the point uh, to go on with. Then this was more on farming. Now, and, and when we're talking about food, I'm not so much talking now about all the, let's say, food processing, even then you're more uh, entering the factor of the future topics. However, when we're talking about food, um, I think it's a lot about uh, from when we're talking about from farm to fork, it's not just an M, uh, so, so a stupid tray. Now we are going to smart trays when we're talking about monitoring location, analysis of freshness. So how fresh is the food for what it is really um, the best use of the food. Um, and also even autonomous routing. So then intelligent logistics directly connected to this. So how to avoid installation costs because the thing is always you have heavily dynamic relations of the stakeholders in the sector. Therefore, uh, you cannot just make one installation, let's say some devices at the street and they are standing there for the next 20 years. It's all about, well, I have one time interaction with suppliers who is then taking care for the installation of the IoT. Therefore, we need also to talk a lot about autonomous devices. Uh, then also those autonomous devices can help me to balance supplies also like right time delivery of packaging, uh, packaging, assuring hygiene, and also preventing theft. We must not underestimate that ch uh, challenge. At the same time, all those, let's say, if I have autonomous devices, especially edge IoT and IO, especially also an IoT to edge IoT is really enabling a new kind of uh, process control and also helping large organizations, helping uh, to, to monitor their flows, monitor what is going on in, in the supply chain, even in the production and how I can really help this for control and optimization. And at the very end, when we're in the supermarket, so how can we really get to an augmented reality? So when we have the digital twin, uh, how can we compare it with our own preferences in the supermarket? So how can we enable consumers to understand the product quality and specifically also value the choice just in time? Like what we see with Amazon Go started in Seattle with, let's say, the just walk out systems, even without a cash desk anymore. Uh, and as well as autonomous delivery, like the pizza delivery already several years ago with robots happening by Starship startup in, in uh, I think it was in Estonia and Daimler some, some years ago. Um, so there are really, now we are, at the upfront that something is happening and how we bring this together in a circular economy, because at the very end, how can we, let's say, bring this together from farm to fork? So trade-off and needs. Um, at the very end, as we are here on the field, we are in harsh conditions. So first processing power versus battery life, again and again, the same topic we need to talk about, um, especially when we are uh, developing new devices. Um, on the other hand, it's also a need on the one hand, yes, with uh, low bandwidth. Uh, I think this was really a new step ahead, enabling a lot in the, uh, in the sector in the sector. However, we think that there's also an increasing need for uh, additional bandwidth. At the same time, of course, the harsh conditions were this reuse and cost of devices. And uh, also we had a lot of discussion in the project about accuracy of IoT devices, uh, because often the problems that uh, people really, that, that's not very clear what is really the accuracy because uh, the, 
a lot of processes, especially on, on control of, of uh, in farming, also require certain accuracy of the device. And that's often not so clear to, um, yeah, how to say, uh, of what is delivered. And like when you're looking there, for instance, I brought there a picture of a use case in IOF, like vibration impact on a tractor, on a camera and stuff like that. So uh, at the very end, also SPT by design, we experienced this also uh, that um, often solutions are just developed and at the very end still, people are thinking on the, on the security, privacy and trust, it's still, I think an issue and we really need to work in this direction. Um, and at the very end, I can conclude many solutions would exist if the cost, costs wouldn't have exceeded the benefits. So there's a lot of willingness. However, it's the, the cost factor is really the challenge. And um, now all the discussion, as we all know uh, about the data availability, the, the value is not in the data, but the knowledge. Therefore, I think we really need also to discuss about the business models that also enable profit and cost sharing and also help consumers to understand the value of the farmer's work. Also, how can we translate this into profit? However, I also want to uh, present a sh shortly an opportunity for innovation. Um, we are in the moment in the Smart AgriHubs open call there I'm leading the work package on the open calls. There we are searching for new innovation experiments. This call is open. It's a continuous submission call scheme. It's open until July next year. However, the next deadline for proposal evaluation will be beginning of November. So if you are also looking in the farming and food uh, perspective, then please also have a look at this. This might be an opportunity also for you to contribute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harald. Uh, very dense and very interesting. Um, I'm sure there will be several questions. Um, now let me give uh, the floor to the next uh, speaker that is the last for this session, that is uh, Devor Mearsman uh, from Open and Agile Smart Cities from OASC. Hello, uh, Monique. And, uh, Thank you. Uh, my uh, camera is still uh, starting up. Ah, there it is. Hello, everybody. Uh, so uh, today I'll, I'll give a, um, a presentation on um, how OSC, let's say, is preparing for uh, the, um, uh, well, the, the, ne the next years in, uh, in IoT and what we have been um, uh, doing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, OASC as a, as a networker, we, we've uh, been at it for more than five years now. Uh, building a minimally interoperable basis uh, in a global community for cities so that even with disparate uh, IoT infrastructures, you can still interoperate on the level of uh, data services and, uh, and solutions. Um, we've grown quite a bit over the last year, so we started out with about 30 cities. Today we're more than 150, including some mega cities, but also uh, you know, lots of communities down uh, the long tail who, who are looking to, to replicate um, across the world. Uh, we're, um, we cover about 30 uh, countries, a little more, uh, uh, 150 million um, uh, inhabitants, and then uh, importantly also quite a significant uh, GDP um, uh, combined number of 3.5 uh, trillion. Um, the uh, core of what we do, we do a lot of things, but the, the core, let's say, of um, uh, the, the activities is to organize a consensus between very different very, uh, cities uh, globally around uh, minimal standards that can be adopted so that we can exchange data solution services. Uh, we have three formally uh, adopted um, uh, mechanisms called the minimal interoperability mechanisms. Uh, so it's a context management API that allows you to exchange data, data models that, uh, well, you, you need to speak the same language, and then ecosystem transactions management that allow you to build, let's say, a living uh, data ecosystem, so you regulate who gets access to what, under which conditions, uh, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, we have two more MIMS underway, so they have been adopted as work items by the General Assembly uh, last January, and we expect them to be formula, formally adopted uh, uh, by, by the next General Assembly, also in January of uh, next year, uh, if you know, everything uh, goes to plan. Um, <clears throat> those MIMS are on uh, personal data management, so that, that allows you to basically handle personal data properly across borders. Uh, and as a lot of, let's say, services are moving 
uh, more into the streets and involving uh, uh, people. And I think, you know, COVID-19 is a very uh, a st a strong example of that. Um, th this is something that is needed, let's say, uh, also as part of these IoT um, uh, ecosystems. And then the other one, uh, equally important, actually, is on uh, FAIR AI. Uh, so that uh, essentially allows you to look under the hood and see where AI took decisions and basically keep uh, human governance uh, on top of things uh, in our cities who, uh, who are, well, which are in, in, in the end, you know, not just um, uh, living labs and testing hubs, but also the places uh, where we live. Um, the status in terms of uh, deployments, uh, we, ha we still have to do a, a proper counting, uh, but we are, I think, well over 30 actually operational deployments of um, uh, MIMS uh, in, within the network. Uh, then the, uh, the formal adoptions, uh, so that's our entire network, which has a lot of big cities in London, Amsterdam, Istanbul, Tokyo, and so forth, but then also, as I said, uh, communities uh, in the long term as well. Um, <clears throat> the, um, so OSC, you know, apart from uh, organizing, let's say, this consensus, what we also uh, try to do is, um, uh, in a sense, act as a catalyst. Uh, so that means we, we represent our cities in various international fora with partners such as the UN, the European Commission, World Economic Forum and so forth. But we also offer uh, services geared towards uh, our cities, but you know, and, and we are, let's say, firmly on the demand side. We don't have com companies anywhere in the governance, but uh, we of course work uh, well with, uh, with uh, the private sector and other types of um, uh, institutions. Uh, and those services tend to kind of, you know, blend those, interface those, and uh, make um, us collaborate on a global level um, uh, together. Uh, so we have three uh, services currently. Uh, one is a catalog uh, that, um, uh, so I'll go in, into a little bit more detail on, uh, on each service. One is a catalog that we are uh, formally launching in November, but there is, um, uh, let's say, a pre-launch in, uh, in October uh, that essentially catalogs what cities are up to around the world in terms of uh, technical deployments, and then also provides a prism on, you know, the, the underpinnings so that uh, you, you really move away from best practice. Um, so you, you see a best practice and you know, okay, what do I need infrastructure-wise uh, and so forth in order to be able to uh, adopt that um, uh, solution. Um, we have a, a festival, so we have our annual conference uh, yearly that we're now moving uh, to a global stage. So we're, we're basically investing quite a lot in uh, repositioning there. Uh, it's fully online. It will be a 48-hour um, uh, event. We're announcing that actually later this month. So this uh, presentation is just a few weeks uh, early. Otherwise, I could have uh, uh, introduced it here as well. Uh, and then we, we uh, have an academy because what, you know, in a sense, what we do as, as a network is we de-risk uh, the market, both for cities and suppliers in, on, on a number of dimensions. But, uh, you know, part of the risk is also a knowledge gap, um, you know, when you see how quick technology is moving uh, and, and uh, well, the, 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 the skill set in your typical uh, public administration. It's clear that there's a delta and we need to reduce that so that um, the digital transformation uh, stops being uh, done with breaks on, uh, so that decisions get taken faster, confidently, and that, of course, uh, right decisions uh, get taken so you don't have too much cost uh, reversing any um, uh, other decisions. Um, <clears throat> so the catalog, uh, we are currently, um, uh, uh, so it's, it's an umbrella of various uh, catalogs, so it's uh, the Connected Smart Cities and Communities catalog under which, uh, for example, also the ICC, so that's the Intelligent Cities uh, Challenge Marketplace uh, is under. Uh, also the OAC catalog with you know, kind of MIM-ready uh, solutions. Um, <clears throat> the ICC Marketplace we are launching in, uh, in, in uh, October. And then a month later, we, we are launching also the, the umbrella, let's say the entry point to, to the various um, uh, catalogs under there. That's an important one, the catalog, because what we do is not just, you know, uh, well, uh, catalog what cities are doing technically. We also link that to impact uh, goals and objectives. So that's our work with the United Nations uh, and, and various, let's say, agencies under there. So it allows also a city to, you know, shop for impact uh, if they want to improve on a certain metric uh, that is, you know, uh, corresponds to a policy uh, objective or another type of uh, objective. Then they can browse the catalog, see what other cities have done. Uh, what type of impact that has had, and also then, of course, what they would need technically uh, to implement that uh, solution. So from the start, actually, we'll have close to 100, uh, sorry, close to 200 
uh, uh, city. So we're currently kind of onboarding all these uh, cities, which you know is quite a work. But I think it will be a great resource uh, for you know uh, both uh, uh, cities, of course, wanting to uh, improve their own uh, societies, but also of course for um, the supply side, who can have a, a good look at you know what cities are up to and uh, how they can uh, contribute to certain. Um, uh, objectives. What we are also doing in the context of the ICC marketplace is adding um, uh, a way to to handle uh, procurements. Uh, uh, there is also that's also I think something to consult. Important to note also, it's completely free uh, to add solutions uh, to the catalog. So if there are any um, uh, companies interested in um, kind of uh, interfacing with us, please get in touch. It's a quite a straightforward process uh, involving forms. A double check by the cities where you have deployed, and then uh, we're good to go. Um, the festival, uh, as I said, uh, so we're going uh, digital this year. It will be on the 13th and the 14th of January. Um, it will run for 48 hours. We follow the sun twice around the world. So we'll have different chapters uh, organizing different parts of uh, the content. And again, uh, I'd like to extend also an invitation uh, to people to reach out uh, and then um, uh, see how we can accommodate the, the great work that has been done within NGIOT and uh, make that, uh, you know, fuse that, let's say, to, to the program and the various aspects of that. Um, finally, the academy, uh, so, so that uh, will be completely online. Uh, the first few courses will be free as well, so it's uh, really a part of, let's say, the mission uh, to, uh, of um, always see to get the, the market to, to know and understand uh, what is the, the right way forward. And the Academy helps us uh, support that goal. Uh, so these are some of the, the topics that we'll be focusing. So, you know, the technical stuff and the standards, uh, how to do, um, uh, uh, you know, innovation experimentation, and then also, um, uh, you know, uh, stuff related more to the technology governance um, that is uh, also um, well, there. Thank you uh, thanks. I tried to keep it uh, quick, and uh, we're at the end of the presentation. So now let's let's um, uh, give the floor. Here I'm asking um, my colleagues that are assisting us uh, with uh, with Zoom if we can show the poll. Um, so I would uh, recommend that either Catherine or Jean Baptiste take the screen, and if you can stop sharing the screen, David. Thank you. Um, and uh, we can uh, show how uh, the poll are going. Um, is this possible or do we do it later? Just a quick question because my colleague, okay. Okay, now can you see the poll? Yes. Okay, great. So the first question is, what are the most challenging aspects related to the edge um, IoT paradigm shift from an application market perspective? So we have, we have heard uh, several uh, representatives. We have heard uh, smart road, um, uh, in particular self-driving cars. We have heard about food and farming. We have heard about smart energy and grid. Um, now, um, what, um, what are the main uh, challenging aspects? Uh, also, people in the audience that have contributed or that have participated to projects can answer. It's um, easy. You can just click and submit your answer. We will then consult what is uh, the overall uh, situation. As you can see, there are several categories, legal, reg regulatory, technological, educational aspects. Now, my question would be for uh, each of um, the speakers that have a uh, more a technical insight. So I would like to ask Tom, Oliver and Harald uh, from their um, perspective, from their experience in the fields that they have uh, presented shortly to us, what among those categories or if any other should be added are bring along. I know that basically there are challenges at all levels, but specifically to your field and to your application domain, what are the major hurdles uh, that uh, we need to face? Uh, I would suggest to go with Tom first, Oliver, and then Harald. Please, uh, short intervention. Okay, this is Tom speaking. Uh, I voted for the technical one. I, I think we are still uh, facing all the discussions to which which technology to use uh, to communicate at the edge uh, and uh, I think regulation and uh, legal aspects will will be then later on 
Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much for the question, Monique. Um, I'm tending in the moment, well, uh, I would rather say governance. Well, of course, fully agree. There are also a lot of technical challenges, no doubt about this. However, we also see a lot of solutions which are in place, which are working. However, they are quite now at a point which, where we need to make them bigger. And there, the question is, who is really owning those solutions? Uh, it's about interoperability. It's about exchanging data. At the same time, then the question comes up about, therefore, I would, well, legal is not the right word. It's also about all the uh, national and European regulations also to report data from farming. There are a lot of heterogeneous IT infrastructures are also there from the public side, really putting a lot of effort for the IT developers. So therefore, I'm, I'm rather in the moment, I would say we have a lot of challenges towards governance. Because, of course, you can implement a lot of solutions, but really to make now the next step, I think uh, there are quite a lot of stakeholders need to put their heads together. Thank you very much, Harald. Um, what about you, Tom? What do you think? Uh, sorry, Oliver. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I would go actually with a regulation for the, the energy sector uh, and that uh, in, in terms of regulation for very different aspects, let's say, of an IoT system um, that goes on security, um, um, but sometimes even to the point where the, the regulation actually um, uh, wants to set a technology that needs to be used. And uh, that together, let's say then with the speed um, of the regulation. I mean, you, if, if regulation is then quick and would set a standard, would set a, um, a what needs to be applied and that needs to be uh, rolled out then one year later, that's okay. But if the regulation process with all, let's say the um, discussion that is around it, takes along for years and then sets a technological standard, um, then that's always problematic because at some point then when you need to implement it, it might already be outdated uh, and is not even, let's say, the, the, the latest uh, technology anymore. So that is for me uh, one of the largest um, uh, points that, that holds it back. Um, thank you very much. Um, I took notes. Um, one observation from Mark Dietrich in the audience. Uh, um, it's very interesting um, and relates an aspect that we probably didn't touch so much that is about um, the business modeling aspects. So these edge computing um, scenarios in which more and more there is a, a convergence of technologies and of technology players um, requires also to think or to rethink uh, about uh, how business models, um, especially uh, now the comment of Mark uh, relates uh, farm uh, data uh, can be built. Um, do you have um, any specific reference, uh, studies, uh, evidence uh, about how edge computing is transforming also business uh, models and business dynamics in the field that you have, uh, that you have um, represented? So, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, it's, we are fully in the middle of this discussion and the, especially the OEMs, so the farm equipment manufacturers, um, are offering already a lot. So we're not just at the start, uh, a lot is, is provided and also they all have their own strategy. However, of course, also in the very beginning, as it's usual, trying to promote, let's say, only their own activities. Now we are more at a, let's say, collaboration strategy starting. And I think now the next moment starts, how can we also even accelerate the innovation? And I think that's the, the challenge also for the next year to enable startups and SMEs to bring fresh ideas to this marketplace and how to open up data because the, the equipment manufacturers have the data. They have their cloud solution. They have their edge solutions. That's there. Standards are developed over the last 20 and 30 years on tractor communication and ISO bus and stuff like that. Um, now the question is really, how can I open the data? How can I make such things accessible 
also when you're talking about security, privacy and trust, also there are quite of even up to legal, legal challenges. However, um, I, I think that's now the big question and there's also about, I think in, this, in the center of gravity, it's a kind of how are we designing the, the competition in a kind of, let's say, uh, OEM driven, monolithic systems or how can we come up with partner strategies which will also and this i think also an advantage and we see for uh the larger companies uh, to have fresh ideas from a startup sme perspectives and as we see more and more of the oems are also involved now in hackathons really trying to to get new ideas and potentials on this and i think that's really a challenge for all of us to think in different directions if I may answer uh, also uh, for, for my field, uh, at the first view, it looks quite easy to say, oh, there is a shuttle operator, he should take care about the infrastructure. <laughs> yes. uh, the problem arises if there are more than one shuttle operator. So in the end, I will see uh, all these infrastructure issues. Uh, uh, it's, it's then a, a job or it's in the, in the maintenance and in the uh, the daily use and uh, of, of a city uh, so that city infrastructure like we have uh, signals and uh, whatever uh, also in the uh, in the infrastructure so that will change definitely the business model we are working on today thank you very much um, unfortunately given that we're 10 minutes late I need to close this uh, first session. Uh, thanks a lot for your intervention. Uh, your presentations, if you agree, uh, will be made available online via the NGIUT website. If you wanna change anything, please free, feel free to do so. And if you don't want to present them, uh, we understand. So let us know. Um, now uh, we will um, have, I think we have a short break, a little coffee break. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, we have about, uh, we had scheduled from 11.30 to 11.40. It's already 11.40, so I suggest we take a five minutes break, if it's okay with you. And we reconvene at um, 11.45. Uh, now you're seeing on, on your screen the poll results. I think 90, 99 people voted. Thanks a lot for active participation. We have uh, uh, 155 uh, participants in the poll today. So full room or almost full room. Um, thanks a lot for your en energy and uh, talk to you back in five minutes. You can stay connected if you want.